More than 5 million Americans have heart valve disease. However, some people never have symptoms and others may dismiss them as a part of aging. Once diagnosed, this heart condition can be successfully treated. That's why early detection and diagnosis are so important. We will provide important information about heart valve disease on this week's Health Talk. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Vicki Smitak. And I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss cardiothoracic surgery and valvular heart disease with Dr. Robert Gallagher. He's Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Western Connecticut Health Network. First time on the show. Welcome, Robert. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So it's a big topic, heart valve disease. It's, uh, it could be a natural part of aging. It could be part of uh, different syndromes. It could be a whole host of different things. Tell us a little bit about, first of all, maybe we can just start with basic anatomy. Um, where are these valves? It, where do they sit inside the heart? Why are they important and what happens to them? Sure. Uh, there are four valves uh, in the heart, two on the right side, two on the left. Um, the, the heart can be divided into um, uh, basically an upper and, and lower chambers. The upper chambers are referred to as atria, the lower chambers are ventricles. There are valves that sit between the atria and the ventricles. Um, and the, on the right side is the tricuspid valve, on the left side that's the mitral valve, and then the two other valves are the pulmonic valve and the aortic valve. The valves that I really want to concentrate on today are the two left-sided heart valves which are the uh, mitral valve and the aortic valve. And those valves are important, aren't they? Because as the heart squeezes, you want the blood to go in the right direction. And so if the blood's coming in from one side, you want it to go out the other side. Uh, exactly right. Basically, it, as, in a very simplistic way. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the valves are, I mean, they're, they're very uh, sophisticated, but they're very simplistic in the sense that they, they um, do allow uh, unidirectional flow of blood through the heart by simply opening and closing and ensuring that uh, as the blood enters each chamber, it, uh, it continues to move forward and doesn't go backwards, and it can move forward without, um, without a lot of restriction of flow. So oh. that's what we mean. So when, when valves are damaged, Robert, or when they're not working anymore, what exactly does that mean? And it could mean a couple of different things, but ultimately, w what does it mean when the function is no longer good? Well, when, when valves start to fail, they fail in one of two ways. They either become narrowed, which is referred to as stenosis, mm -hmm. or they become leaky, which is referred to as incompetent or, uh, or regurgitant. Um, the aortic valve um, usually has a problem with uh, stenosis. That's the predominant um, you know, uh, pathologic condition that it, that it uh, suffers from. Most of the time, uh, aortic uh, stenosis is a result of a calcific process that occurs as sort of a process of aging. Um, people can develop aortic stenosis if they have two leaflet valves instead of three leaflet valves, which is something that they're born with. That tends to present a, at an earlier age. Um, the mitral valve doesn't often become stenotic. The only time we see uh, stenosis of the mitral valve is in uh, patients who have rheumatic disease. And rheumatic disease in the yeah, United rheumatic States. Fever, not yeah, well, they fever. started out, they had untreated strep infection as a child, right. re resulting in rheumatic fever, and then later on it affected the valves, and over time the valve becomes thick and stiff. It's, uh, when you look at those valves, it's very characteristic that this is a, a, you know, a patient who had rheumatic fever at one time. So um, that's rarely seen in this country. It is still seen in underdeveloped countries. Usually those patients present much earlier, they present in their 30s. The, uh, the problem it's interesting. I saw a case of, of acute rheumatic fever mm -hmm. as a medical student in Baltimore. I have not seen one since. So it, it's really. I can't say that I've seen and one. And she's a pedi pe uh, as a pediatrician. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's become such an almost non existent disease in this country. Well, now it? with rapid stress te uh, strep tests, people can diagnose it early, get mm -hmm. put on appropriate antibiotics, and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's something that we don't, we don't really see. The, the problem with uh, mitral valves really is a, a regurgitant uh, lesion. It usually results from uh, you mean leaky. You said, leakiness. said that. But yeah, that mitral valve that. prolapse is the most common thing, and the, the medical term uh, for the for the disease process that results in the prolapse is uh, fibroelastic deficiency. Basically, what that means is the fibrous tissue and the elastic tissue in the valve and in the supporting uh, structures uh, under the valve become sort of stretched. And so that the leaflets can't, um, can't co-op It's properly. sort of what happens mm -hmm. to our skin as we get older, right? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> if we could pull up the graphic, um, I could, we could show you a little bit about what that, uh, what that valve would look like. 
If you look in the upper right corner there, it's a little bit dark, but you can see a valve that looks like it has two, two pieces of tissue connected by some strings underneath, and that's the, um, that is the, uh, the mitral valve. And that valve should open as blood returns from the, from the lungs and allow passage of blood into the left yeah. ventricle. So which actually, is, that's in the heart with those two jellyfish that we're seeing on it, the right side. That's right, in the heart, mm -hmm. and, then, um, and the, the major muscular chamber that you see there is the left ventricle. So blood comes back from the lungs, passes through the mitral valve, and then once the heart contracts, it uh, pushes the blood out through the aorta and out through that, through that aortic valve. Um, that particular um, image demonstrates a uh, uh, aortic valve that's become uh, calcified and stenotic, but it also is a good representation of the, uh, of the mitral valve, which, uh, which has the little cordy underneath. I often tell patients a mitral valve looks like a parachute that's sort of been cut in half. Blood comes, hits the dome of the parachute and comes down, and when the heart contracts, the, the parachute billows back up, the strings need to hold, and, um, and, and if, that, if that anatomy is altered in any way, either the, the two edges of the leaflets are pulled apart or, or one leaflet rises above the other, that's when you get a regurgitant, a regurgitant valve. So what really happens then, again, for our viewers at home, regurgitant means that the blood flow, it, it, you're getting backflow basically, backflow, right? Exactly. So the valve yeah. is not competent enough to push, to, to keep the blood from backflowing, and it's backflowing right. back so into that chamber. So if you think chamber. about the mitral regurgitation, yeah. the blood, rather than going out to the body through the aorta, is sort of being pushed back towards the lungs. Sure. And, uh, and so that gives you all the symptoms that we're going to get to in a few minutes, yeah. as opposed to the, the difference between that, and I just want to make sure that we're really clarifying it in, in sort of basic terms, versus stenosis, which is a narrowing, like you said, which is the blood is trying, the heart is trying its best to push that blood through, but the valve is so narrow that it can't get through, and that's yeah, the right. difference. It's sort of like trying to breathe in and out through a straw. Exactly. Right? So you're not kind of more that's resistance. a good analogy, actually. Yeah, it's probably exactly. easier, yeah. probably more sucky than blowing, but it's still. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, are we seeing more valvular disease now than we did 30, 40 years ago because people are living longer? Or, it, or has this always been there and we're just diagnosing it better? I think it may be a combination of those two things. I think um, is, there's no question that valvular disease is seen more as we age. So with each passing decade from the 50s on up through 80s and 90s, the percentage uh, of individuals with valvular disease uh, goes up. It can be, uh, if you're in your 40s, maybe 1 or 2 percent. If you're in your uh, 80s, it could be as high as 15 percent. Um, the tests that we use to diagnose valvular disease, though, have become more sophisticated as well. So, um, so we're, we're um, detecting it earlier. So it's hard to, to distinguish how much of it is uh, an increase in, in, the, in the percentage of patients that are getting it versus, versus actually picking it up at an, at an earlier point in time. Is it usually diagnosed based on symptoms or patients are I was are just going to get to that. Yeah, right, or, or is there a way to diagnose it to your point? Before it actually becomes, before the patient becomes symptomatic. Yeah, oftentimes it's it's uh, picked up by a primary care provider that hears a murmur, and then they okay. they send the patient for, and the patient may say, I don't, I don't have any symptoms, I feel fine, and they say, well, let's let's just get an echo and and uh, check it out and see, you know, see where the murmur is coming from. So a murmur is an abnormal sound or or a sound that maybe wasn't there before. That's that right. I mean, normally when hear. you listen to a heart, unless. Um, um, there are some, flow mur some murmurs that are called functional right. flow, uh, flow murmurs um, that are just in people that have such uh, um, strong hearts right. that the, the amount of blood that gets pumped out, called the stroke volume, is so great that it can actually tumble a little bit as the blood moves forward and creates a, the sound of a murmur. Right. Sometimes you see that in, in uh, pregnant women. They have an increase in cardiac output right. because they're pregnant. And, uh, and they develop murmurs, but there's nothing wrong with their valves. It's and in just, children, we, you know, we it's just a functional well, children, murmur. anemic patients will sometimes do Anemic that. patients as well, yeah. But, uh, but the vast majority of people who have murmurs, they're usually pathologic, and they usually mm -hmm. come from an acceleration of flow through a narrowed orifice <clears throat> when, uh, when you're speaking about a stenotic valve. And then in the mitral valve, it's not narrowed, but it, it, the blood tends to tumble as it goes uh, um, backwards through, mm -hmm. the, through the mitral valve. And that tumbling and sort of uh, swishing sound that we hear is the murmur that we pick up when we uh, listen with our stethoscope. I think you think of a river yeah. you know, flowing smoothly between its banks and then a narrowing and it gets tumbled up and gets, gets noisy. Turbulent, it's turbulent, uh, you know, at, yeah, yeah. and creates eddy currents. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, do, would you say most referrals are, are coming in based on 
uh, you know, clinical exam and, and hearing a new murmur, or is it more symptomatic patients who are saying, hey, I'm having some issues with my breathing or chest pain and what have it's you? It's probably, you know, the, the onset of symptoms often is later in the course of the disease, and I think yeah. we're getting better and better about picking it up early. That's great. So I think, uh, I think the um, uh, primary care docs are, are you know, hearing murmurs, yeah. or maybe sometimes a patient will complain of a little, a little shortness of breath, and they'll, and they'll say, well, let's just do a little, you know, further diagnostic study, and, and let's get an echo, and let's get a chest x-ray, and see if we can figure out, you know, why you're a little short of breath. But I would have to say, most of it is picked up early, yeah. and uh, before the patient even has symptoms. And that's really mm -hmm. important, because sure. as I know you'll discuss, the heart begins to change under these stresses. It remodels, it gets, yeah. the, the left ventricle get thicker. You could actually get heart damage from prolonged leaky valves or stenotic valves. That's right. And so you want to catch them at just the right time. So maybe we could go, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the different symptom complexes you see with mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis. So that's the leaky valve between the two chambers, and that, that's the stenotic aorta is the stenotic valve at the end of the left chamber that pumps into the body. Um, well, with aortic stenosis, there's sort of a classic triad of symptoms. It's shortness of breath. Uh, it's also um, dizziness, or sometimes if the patient uh, uh, has a decrease in blood flow to the brain, they can actually faint because during exertion, uh, not enough blood can get through that stenotic valve. And the last thing is, is uh, chest pressure or chest pain. So those are the three sort yeah. of cardinal and symptoms. And those are, by the time you get there, it's really late, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you've usually, you know, once you become symptomatic, I mean, they showed even back in the 1960s that there can be a very long latent period where patients are, are asymptomatic, and, but when, once you develop the onset of symptoms, the mortality over the course of the next two years you know, rises yeah. significantly. And we have just a, a brief uh, few moments left in this segment. You said talk about the mitral valve, the, uh, why people get shorter breath with the mitral valve and what happens to the lung and the vasculature. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with, um, with sort of the back pressure that's created. So as we mentioned earlier, blood should flow through the heart in a unidirectional fashion. And so if, if there's a backwash of blood into the left atrium, which is the, the chamber on the other side of the mitral valve, uh, that pressure is transmitted back into the lungs, right. and as it goes back into the lungs, you get um, you get high pressures in the lungs. Eventually, you can actually get fluid that kind of that is sort of pushed through the lungs and ends up in the lung tissue, and um, and the patient can get short of breath because now there's essentially water right. filling the mm -hmm. uh, filling the lungs. So that the, these defects really have significant secondary sequela. And so we have, that's all we have time for now, but when we come back, we'd like to talk a little bit mm -hmm. about, you know, how the diagnosis is made and then how you can correct and it, surgery, which is so course. exciting. And uh, so we'll be back after this short break. Hi, we're back with Dr. Robert Gallagher, cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, sort of the pinnacle of surgery, as everybody that's right. Everybody talks about. So we were talking a little bit about uh, valvular heart disease. Uh, when when should someone? How do you decide when someone actually needs their valve replaced? Well, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, valvular heart disease is being detected earlier and earlier because of the ease of access to uh, an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram really is is the primary diagnostic tool that we use to, um, to diagnose uh, valvular just to problems. Point out for, that's using sound waves to image the heart, so. So it's an ultrasound. That's right, it's, it's an, like ultrasound an ultrasound of the heart. heart. It's very, very, it's benign, it has no radiation exposure, and the pictures are amazing. The pictures have gotten you know, better and better over the years. Um, most of them are what we call transthoracic, meaning it's done on the surface of the chest, um, and you can get very good images. Sometimes people with emphysema or uh, very large chests might not image uh, that well, but the vast majority of people, you can, you can do an external uh, echocardiogram and make the diagnosis. If patients uh, are found in an asymptomatic stage, then, and they have mild to moderate disease, they're just followed, and probably their primary care doc or their cardiologist would recommend that they be uh, followed uh, annually with, with echoes. Um, as the disease gets more severe 
and the uh, or and or the patient becomes symptomatic, um, you reach a point at which uh, the doctor will say, "Well, we think you know your valve needs to be addressed surgically at this point in time because it's we've followed it as long as we possibly can." So these valves. So when you say approach surg surgically, we're talking about replacing these valves, right? These valves are not are, are no longer they're not fixable, right? And you have some um, some props that you're going to show us when we talk a little bit, or we or you can show us now what an actual valve looks like, uh, a replacement valve, if you will, because this is this is really neat stuff. It's actually really neat for me to see it. Um, sitting here on a table. So maybe we can do that because this will be very fascinating for me as well. Sure. Um, you can show us what, what it looks like and we can get a close up for our viewers at home. Yeah. Um, the uh, the aortic that. valve, they tried decalcifying it years ago and it didn't, it didn't really work. I mean, it worked in the immediate perioperative period, but uh, long term it didn't last. So you, the only time you can repair an aortic valve is if it's, um, if it's a leaky valve. Sometimes you can actually um, address what the problem is. You can either tighten it or if there's a prolapse leaflet, you can, you can pull it up to its proper orientation. Yeah. And so you can fix that valve. Or if there's an aneurysm, an enlargement of the aorta around the valve, mm. you can replace the, uh, the aorta and, and then put that, that valve and back inside the ground. open heart surgery. Just open heart fun. surgery, exactly. Right. But by and large, you know, almost all aortic valves need to be replaced. And there are two basic categories of valves that, um, uh, that we have. The one I have in my right hand is, is referred to as a bioprosthetic valve or a tissue valve. This particular one is a bovine pericardial valve. So that's a valve that comes from the heart sac uh, of a cow. Uh, it's constructed to look like the original aortic valve. It has three leaflets. Uh, that open and close very similarly to an, a native aortic valve. It is mounted on a metal frame and then the, the entire thing is covered with a cloth. So that entire thing, Robert, sits inside the patient's yeah. chest That's right. you put and it you in. And you sew that white ring then to the, to the annulus, that area around the aorta, between the aorta and the left ventricle. That's right. It's sewn. Mm -hmm. So we take the, the leaflets out, we debride the calcium from the frame of the valve, which is the annulus, as you mentioned, and then, uh, and then we put the stitches in the annulus put them through the, what's called the sewing ring of the valve, which is right here, mm -hmm. and then lower this in and secure it into place. This uh, valve on the left is uh, referred Which is the viewer's right, just to be. <laughs> okay, is, uh, is, a, um, is referred to as a mechanical valve. Um, it is a bileaflet valve. It opens and closes passively with flow as well, and, um, and, and uh, functions um, you know, very similarly to the tissue valve in that it, it uh, is flow directed. and looks like the, the vents I have in my heating system at home. Yeah, on the it's, floor. it's, I mean, the, <laughs> that's sort of though. the beauty of it is that it, the design is simple, but it's so effective. And they basically are indestructible. They, they, um, they last, you know, almost as long as the patient will last. And the only time we ever really take these out is, uh, is if they get infected. So the benefit of a, of a mechanical valve is its durability. The downside is you have to stay on a blood thinner, Coumadin, and it does make a little clicking noise, which some people said they, they won't be able to tolerate. Hmm. Um, the uh, tissue valve, on the other hand, um, is silent, makes no noise, other than if you listen to a, the, the patient with a stethoscope, you might still hear a little residual murmur. Uh, it does not require long-term anticoagulation, but the downside is it, it won't last uh, permanently. So the durability of this valve is age dependent and unfortunately the younger you are the less durable these valves are. So if you're 50 this might last 12 or 15 years. If you're 70 you know you might get 20 years out of it. Is so that because is younger that? people are more active and yeah. that they're... They, the they don't really know. They don't really know what the process is and why it's age, age related like that. How do you make the decision, or how does the patient make the decision, or how do you make the decision? Is it really cut and dry? Like, are there very strict criteria saying that if you're a certain age, um, uh, you get this kind of valve versus the other kind, or is it more patient preference? Like, if somebody doesn't want to be on anticoagulation therapy, for example, uh, or if they have other risk factors, you might opt to put in the uh, the, the other type of valve. How, how does that decision making happen? Yeah, I mean. Uh uh, I often try to educate the patient and then let them make the decision because mm -hmm. really they're the ones that are going to have to live with it. Either they're going to have to live with the fact that they're going to need a second procedure at some point in time, possibly, or that they're going to have to um, you know, manage their Coumadin and their, and their blood thinning f for the remainder of their life if they choose a mechanical valve. But from so, a functional standpoint, they're both equally good. They equally good, They do the yeah. same job, they do it well. Exactly. It's just a matter of 
those other things. That's right. It's a, it's a matter of, you know, second operation or not, mm -hmm. and or Coumadin or not. And and there's been a huge move away from mechanical valves because people nowadays seem not to want to have to deal with the management that goes along with blood thinning. It requires blood tests right. and adjustment of the Coumadin dosage. Right. Um, also known for folks at home, the brand name is Warfarin. Warfarin. The people may know better. Right. But let me, I was, as a hematologist, I, I actually don't know the answer to this question. Are there any studies going on using some of the novel new anticoagulant agents with artificial valves? No, uh, not, not that I'm aware of. And, you know, we wish that, that uh, they would because it would make, uh, I think... Because that might change the equation because right. it doesn't require monitoring. And, yeah. and you'd think that they should work, but you don't know that at this point. I think when you look at the number of people who have atrial fibrillation, for which most of these novel anticoagulants are used, uh, it's far greater than the people who have valvular heart disease that might choose a mechanical valve. And so I think uh, the companies have possibly chosen not to study them in those patients because if they end up in the study uh, trials that, uh, that they don't work properly, and the consequence potentially is the patient could have a stroke. So I think when they, when they look at the number of patients versus the liability involved, uh, my guess is, is that they don't really want to study the no novel agents in patients with mechanical valvular disease, you know, valvular it's, replacements. It's too bad because it might, well, if it does work as well as warfarin, it would offer people a, a much simpler alternative. And then avoid the second surgery yeah. down yeah. the road. Because people in their 50s and 60s, that's sort of the in-between age. Somebody in their 40s, I almost always try and direct them to a mechanical valve because they said, you know, you could end up looking at three valve surgeries in the course of your lifetime. Mm. And you really don't want to do that. Each time you go back, it's tougher and riskier. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, just, just how debilitating is the operation? Yeah, so what's the this surgery This is a, a big like? operation, isn't it? It is big. And a lot of it depends on, you know, comorbidities and, and the, the status of the heart, you know, uh, as the patient, you know, comes in for surgery. But, um, but the first-time surgery is, is relatively low risk. Uh, primarily because we've we've opted to operate on these patients earlier than we did years ago, and I think that's the the beauty of following Waiting before these, the heart starts to fail. That's and right. Trying to catch them when they're strong and can tolerate. Yeah, following these patients. I mean, there's definitely been a, a swing of the pendulum back towards early detection and earlier intervention before the heart starts to to deteriorate and function. How quickly and, do patients go home after having a surgery like mind. that? Yeah, because this is, you know, we talk so much, and Eric and I have done so many shows on minimally invasive surgeries of all different kinds. This is clearly not that, and it can't be, I mean, in the, in the setting that we're talking about. But still, everyone's interested in recovery times, and even with open-heart surgery, it's not what it used to be, right? Patients are still going home probably earlier than they used to. They Maybe are. You can talk a little bit about that. Yep. I mean, usually the, uh, the patient will go home in about five or six days. Again, some of it depends on how old they are, how debilitated they are when they come in, mm -hmm. other problems that they might have, whether or not they develop arrhythmias after the surgery. But, uh, but for the most part, if, if it's a relatively straightforward, low-risk valve replacement, say an aortic valve replacement, the patient will be home in about five days. And we have just a few seconds left. Could you say something about TAVRs? I, uh, we've done shows on this, but it's a non-invasive way to replace the aortic valve transvenously. Uh, tell us, just say a few words about how that fits in with what we were talking about today. Sure. Um, uh, TAVR stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It, it originated back in around 2002. First case was done in France, and, uh, and it was initially designed for patients who were considered to be inoperable. It was a novel uh, way of approaching this. It's a valve that's actually mounted in what you can think of as being almost like a cylindrical wire cage. Uh, it's crimped. Uh, down to a very tight um, uh, dimension so that it can be introduced either uh, through the, the leg artery. Uh, sometimes if there, there's um, atherosclerosis in the leg arteries, it has to be introduced in other areas, but the, the uh, delivery sheets have become s so small now that probably 95 to 98 percent of patients can get it through their leg. It's delivered up through the aorta and around the arch and down to the, um, to the aortic valve. And when the uh, when the valve is deployed, some of them are self-expanding, some of them are balloon expanded, um, then it's, it sort of locks into the existing valve that's there. So the leaflets aren't removed 
unlike what we would so do. It just pushes the, old valve up against the, the leaflets just get yeah. pushed apart and, uh, and the valve actually locks into that calcium and that, and that uh, yeah. diseased valve. That's, and that's interesting and, our, and that's all we have time for. Unfortunately, our segment went by very quickly, but we would love to have you stay on to help answer our viewer question this week. Um, so this was a great yep. discussion. I've certainly and we, learned a we'll lot. We'll take the break and we'll come back after a short break. Right now, we're going to also take a look at some of our future events sponsored by Western Connecticut Health Network. This week's viewer question is, what is the best test to determine if I have valvular heart disease? And maybe I could ask you to expand that as, when should I get this test? When should I be, what's the threshold for testing for valvular heart disease? I think the best test by far and away is an echocardiogram, that ultrasound test that we were referring to earlier. Um, it's simple, it's, uh, there's no radiation involved, it's basically non-invasive, it's done on the surface of the chest. So uh, it's, it's, and it gives us excellent images not only images of all of the intracardiac structures, but uh, images of, of uh, flow within the heart and resistance to flow in a stenotic valve or back flow, as we mentioned earlier, for, for regurgitation. So it's the best test. So because it's so non-invasive, any time a murmur is detected, I think a patient should have a, an echocardiogram, even as a baseline, because if you're going to follow that patient over the course of their lifetime, you want to know you know, you want to uh, know where they're starting from. Start, yeah. Where they're exactly. starting from and how it progresses over time and know when to intervene because you never want them to fall off the right. cliff, so to speak. Right. And that's all we have time for. So thank you thank so you. much. Very, very interesting topic. If you at home have a question you'd like to ask on Health Talk, please contact Vicki and me at HealthTalk at NorwalkHealth.org. Eric and I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Robert Gallagher, for coming on Health Talk today. And we will see you next week on Health Talk. Bye-bye.